Your own self is your ultimate teacher. The outer teacher is merely a milestone. It is only your inner teacher that will walk with you to the goal, for he is the goal. कल्पना जी होती है, कल्पना भी रखता है। अतः आकाश ही जब पाप पापड़ी का प्रकाश है, पापड़ी वो जंतर आकाश निर्माण होते हैं। तो कैसा है? प्रमाण न पड़े या नहीं जरा स्पर्श के लाना ही तो आया। प्रमाण न पड़े या नहीं सुधार जाला स्पर्श किसी ना कोई रखना है, तो आया। कोई मनन नहीं मन। तुमने और कुछ नहीं तो जाने के मन से लाइन मनना? He says मनन जी ने और कुछ तुम्हारा कल। Your argument leads to finally this that you are not able to frame any concepts to grasp it. Therefore you feel helpless. That is the only thing. You want to catch it by concept. You want to frame certain words and say here it is. There you fail because you are bound to fail. He says, my state is such, that ultimate state. You cannot describe it, but it always proves of the universes. I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce you to one of the great repositories of wisdom in modern times, Nisargadatta Maharaj. Nisargadatta lived in Bombay, India, but his outlook was universal. He led the modest life of a shopkeeper to provide for his family's needs and saw only consciousness, God, or the self in all beings. Free from any outward expression of traditional or religious practices, he simply lived in an awareness that is an undivided whole. His appearance was unassuming and his modest way of life was a great example of authentic non-duality in expression. And the extraordinary aspects of his life really lie in the very ordinary way he lived and worked in the tenements of Bombay. It's to these busy back lanes that earnest seekers of truth traveled from all over the world simply to hear his words and ask him questions relating to their own quest for self-knowledge. Maharaja's message was always the same. You exist as the pure awareness, the supreme principle beyond mind and body. Abide as that. And while he guided those who turned to him through words, it was the sheer authentic experience of living in the consciousness beyond body and mind that empowered his words and awoke the recognition of truth in the hearts and minds of those who listened to him. Nisargadatta always spoke from his own direct experience hammering away at visitors' conceptions and intellectual understandings of truth and freedom, teaching that one is already free and has never been bound by turning within. One will see that the mind is a collection of thoughts, simply a shadow on the screen of consciousness. Maharaja's was an intense look that pierced into the very depths of the soul, yet infinitely compassionate to those who desired to wake up from the dream of ignorance. Again and again, the Sargadatta Maharaj asks those who seek to find the seeker and discover their real nature. Join me 
as we learn about the only journey worth taking, the journey of self-discovery. There is absolutely no difference between me and others, except in my knowing myself as I am. I am all. I know it for certain, and you do not. In reality, I am neither hearing nor answering. In the world of events, the question happens and the answer happens. Nothing happens to me. Everything just happens. My destiny was to be born a simple man, a humble tradesman with little formal education. My life was of the common kind with desires and fears. When through faith in my teacher and obedience to his words, I realized my true being, I left behind my human nature to look after itself until its destiny is exhausted. Occasionally an old reaction emotional or mental, happens in the mind. But it is at once noticed and discarded. After all, as long as one is burdened with a personality, one is exposed to its idiosyncrasies and habits. The fact that a young man who grew up in very impoverished circumstances, who had no formal education whatsoever uh, was granted the uh, the great enlightenment to me is 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 a wonderful exemplification of the egalitarianism that 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 enlightenment is for everybody for night watchmen for bus drivers for people enlisted in the army as well as for doctors lawyers and uh, professional yogis um, that a life of spiritual practice and a, and a life uh, uh, committed to serving uh, in the world is entirely compatible. Um, and I felt that Nisargadatta exemplified this wonderfully, that one does not have to be in a, a beautiful spiritual retreat uh, to engage, uh, embrace a spiritual practice one can do it in the seediest, most polluted, most rowdy, noisy, distracting uh, suburb of Bombay, which must be one of the most intensely populated cities in the world, then any of us can embrace spiritual practice uh, anywhere in the world. Nisargadatt was a wild, old Indian guy who had sold cigarettes on the street, and then somehow had this extraordinary realization and sat in his apartment and waited for people to visit. He was, as you can see from the pictures, not a particularly handsome man, um, yet there was some way in which he radiated a kind of joy and beauty and presence that you would just fall in love with him, or that there was something so magnetic, not even about him, but about this enormous void that he was the mouthpiece for. These words came from far beyond this little old Indian guy who'd sold beaties. And to be in his presence was remarkable. Nisargadatta Maharaj was born in 1897 his parents named him Maruti Shivrampant Kampli. He was raised in a village south of Bombay where he helped his father in agricultural pursuits. In 1924, Maruti married and eventually became the father of four children. Not long thereafter, he opened a small shop in which he sold household items, tobacco, and beadies, a type of handmade cigarette. The shop prospered, allowing Maruti to open several more of these. During this period, Maruti enjoyed associating with people who had an inclination to discuss religious and philosophical subjects. 
the latent desire to experience what he discussed through these talks was being slowly awakened. Although his successful businesses were enough to keep the family in moderate comfort, it was not enough to satisfy the inner contentment that Maruti longed for. He was a man imbued with a deeply religious temperament and so decided to adopt several religious practices designed to fulfill this inner longing. One of Maruti's friends had been visiting a holy man in Bombay and convinced Maruti to join him on the next visit. Maruti was 34 at the time, and this visit proved to be the turning point in his life, for the thirst for truth ultimately led him to his guru, Siddhamareshwar Maharaj. Maruti immediately accepted the holy man as his teacher and began his spiritual practice with great faith and determination. Maharaj later said of his teacher, When I met my guru, he told me, You are not what you take yourself to be. Find out what you are. Watch the sense I am. Find your real self. I obeyed him because I trusted him. I did as he told me. All my spare time I would spend looking at myself in silence and what a difference it made, and how soon. It took me only three years to realize my true nature. My guru died soon after I met him, but it made no difference. I remembered what he told me and persevered. The fruit of it is here with me. The first day I was there, he said that the consciousness that was in me and in, uh, in him and in <laughs> that donkey out there, and Sri Krishna was the same consciousness. No, no, <laughs> no way. So I right away went to Victoria Station, tried to get a ticket home and back to the ashram. No, I couldn't get a seat for a week. So I had to stay a week. Uh, so that's how I got there. Art was not usual guru. What was for me extraordinary was the fact that he was a very, very simple man. He was saying, I, I know I can hardly write and read, which was a little exaggerated, I think. But of course, he never read the, the Veda. He never quoted any holy script, scripture or anything. Sometime he, he, say, he said, when Krishna told Arjuna about his real identity, the Parabrahman, he was talking about me also. Or very, quite often, often he said, uh, what I'm telling you is not from book. I don't repeat the, the, the words of others. It's never hearsay. It's my story that I'm telling you, my story. We had been told by our friends to get the book, I Am That. We were in India, and I didn't want to see any more gurus. I'd had my fill of gurus, not again. So our friend cabled us from Argentina, told us to go and get I Am That. So we went and we bought the book, and uh, we ran straight over to Maharaja's residence. The address was given there and we rang the doorbell and his daughter-in-law answered and she said to us um, I, we said Maharaj and she said um, come back come back 11 o'clock so we went back to the beach and we began to read I am that furiously very quickly and we came back at 11 o'clock I walked up the stairs and my heart was pounding and somebody had just been thrown out because he was wearing a yellow robe I think they were the Rajneesh people and he'd thrown them out and I said God I hope you won't throw us out and then he he pointed his finger at me you where are you from what's your name where are you from and of course their translators were sitting there and I said France 
what do you know? And I told him what I thought I knew. I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm pure consciousness. He tapped his head and he said, you sit down. I was ever so happy that I immediately, I felt this is it, this is it at last. And from then on it was, <laughs> I was in, in a state of bliss. What made it so extraordinary to be with Miss Argadot was to be with someone who wanted nothing from you. I have never in my life been with another person who wanted less from me or anybody. And in that not wanting anything, there was a sense of tremendous freedom and tremendous love. Sometimes he would look at people and he would say, I don't understand you, as if to pull his hair out, he was always gesticulating and so forth. He would say, you never want what's true. You are so entangled in the illusion of the false. He said, you want what you don't have, and you don't have what you want, and so you suffer, and you continue to suffer. Then he said, it's so perplexing. Why not simply reverse it? Why not want what you have and not want what you don't have? He said, it's so simple, you could be happy. Freedom is here for the taking. You want little things, you could have the entire universe, eternity, eternal life. Take that. In 1936, after the death of his guru, Maruti suddenly abandoned his family and prosperous businesses and began wandering as a mendicant throughout India. During these wanderings, he chanced to meet a fellow disciple of Siddhamareshwar Maharaj, who persuaded him that an active life of dispassionate action was far more meaningful than such wanderings. Maruti took this advice to heart and returned to Bombay to find only one of his biggie shops still thriving. Feeling that this was enough for his modest needs, he worked during the day at the shop while devoting himself to the quest for self-realization. Maruti felt the need to have separate quarters to intensify his quest, so he constructed an upper floor to his modest Bombay flat. He would retire to this residential loft to spend time in inner solitude. By the age of 37, Maruti had realized his true nature as the eternal consciousness, and took the name Nisargadatta, which means one who dwells in the natural state, beyond manifestation. Later, when the depths of his realization could no longer be hidden, visitors came from all over the world to visit Nisargadatta Maharaj and have their doubts cleared. Over the years, more and more people began to visit Maharaj, in his small upstairs room and bring with them the hopes, fears and ideas about spiritual life that were built on the edifice of conceptual thought. Maharaj would directly see into the deepest regions of their being and return them to the truth of their own identity, helping them to transcend the limited ideas about who and what they truly are. I think Nisargadatta really, his teachings and the way that he taught is very, very available to a Western seeker, particularly people who are very psychologically oriented, people who are ready to look at their consciousness, are aware of their the patterns of their mind, and again, willing to look at, willing to confront anything that goes on in their consciousness. Um, unlike a lot of other uh, Eastern paths, rather than trying to totally... Uh, transcend, detach, uh, I would use the word dissociate, from their consciousness, their experience, um, which is much more of an Eastern way. I think this kind of brings together both sides, which is the ability to look at what's there and also the ability to look at what's there and let go of what's there. And one of the things that Maharaj always taught was that you really can't let go of something until you know what it is. We are so used in the West here to think that in order to uh, attain something or become something uh, special, that we have to work at it, we have to practice something, we have to do something in order to become something. That is how we are educated. 
When it comes to truth, the absolute truth, all the Advaita teachers, including Maharaj, have told us, told us very succinctly that we already are what we seek. And all the exercises and methods, in fact, are futile. But we may have to go through them for many, many years in order to realize that. Maharaj wastes no time at all. He goes straight to the issue of the I am, and he says there is nothing you need to become. All that is required is a change in understanding only. You have merely to understand what you are not, and what you are will become very clear at that point. So it is very, very different from the progressive ways, which can go on forever and perhaps never, never arrive at, uh, at, what they, at what they seek. Maharaj asks us to take what is known, that which is mind stuff, as it were, to discover that which is beyond the mind and real. Because to go direct to the real would be an exercise in self-deception. It would still be the mind playing its old tricks. It would still be the mind projecting all kinds of wonderful concepts. But concepts they are. But to see concept as concept immediately brings the silence into being. And in that silence, something much greater is being perceived. And this is the soundest, the safest way to proceed. A visitor asked Maharaj why realization of one's true nature is so important. Without realization, you will be consumed by desires and fears, repeating themselves meaninglessly in endless suffering. Most of the people do not know that there can be an end to pain. But once they have heard the good news, Obviously, going beyond all strife and struggle is the most urgent task that can be. You know that you can be free, and now it is up to you. Either you remain forever hungry and thirsty, ever losing and sorrowing, or go out wholeheartedly in search of the state of timeless perfection to which nothing can be added, from which nothing can be taken away. In it, all desires and fears are absent, not because they were given up, but because they have lost their meaning. Seekers who visited Maharaj wanted to know how they too could come to this awareness. How do you go about finding anything? By keeping your mind and heart on it. Interest there must be, and steady remembrance. To remember what needs to be remembered is the secret of success. You come to it through earnestness. Seek a clear mind and a clean heart. All you need is to keep quietly alert, inquiring into the real nature of yourself. This is the only way to peace. All happens by itself. Neither the seeker nor the Guru does anything. Things happen as they happen. Blame or praise are a portion later, after the sense of doership appears. What I wanted was a total stabilization. And through the inquiry, and through the learning how to inquire and take apart your consciousness, your personal consciousness, the empty space becomes more and more available. And so, it becomes an ongoing process that you don't have to work at anymore. There's not a, a working at it all the time. It's just what, what is. Maharaj says, you are the absolute. You are Paramatman. And when you were in front of that man, so simple in that such a, a, a poor room where he was living it, and so obviously with a body that was suffering so much, and when he, he tell you that, you, you, you saw it. You convince. You saw it. You, you feel it. The essential point of his teaching is that we already are absolutely free, and that there is nothing that we have to do or make or become or change ourselves into. We simply have to see the truth of life 
which is that we are not this body nor this mind, that they are a play of elements, if you will, and that when we understand that, there comes this extraordinary happiness and freedom. That's all. Often, visitors would ask Nisargadatta about effort and the role that spiritual disciplines play in helping one awaken from the dream of ignorance. When effort is needed, effort will appear. When effortlessness becomes essential, it will assert itself. You need not push life about. Just flow with it and give yourself completely to this task of the present moment, which is to die now to the now, for living is dying. Without death, life cannot be. Ultimately, one must go beyond knowledge. But the knowledge must come, and knowledge can come by constant meditation. By meditating, the knowledge I am gradually settles down and merges with universal knowledge, and thereby becomes totally free, like the sky or space. Those who come here with the idea of getting knowledge, even spiritual knowledge, come here as individuals aspiring to get something. That is the real difficulty. The seeker must disappear. When you know your real nature, the knowledge I am remains. But that knowledge is unlimited. It is not possible for you to acquire knowledge. You are knowledge. You are what you are seeking. Your true being exists prior to the arising of any concept. Dive deep within yourself and you will find it easily and simply. Go in the direction of I am. All exists in the mind. Both mind and body are intermittent states. The sum total of these flashes creates the illusion of existence. Inquire what is permanent in the transient, real in the unreal. This is sadhana, or spiritual practice. All those who have realized on the spot, by mere touch, look, or thought, have been ripe for it, but such are very few. The majority needs some time for ripening. Sadhana is accelerated ripening. How is one to approach this awareness of which Maharaj speaks from the point of view of being one with it? You must realize, first of all, that you are the proof of everything, including yourself. None can prove your existence, because his existence must be confirmed by yours first. Your being and knowing are your own. You do not come from somewhere. You do not go anywhere. You are timeless being and awareness. Develop the witness attitude, and you will find in your own experience that detachment brings control. The state of witnessing is full of power. There is nothing passive about it. Just keep in mind the feeling, I am. Merge in it, till your mind and feeling become one. By repeated attempts, you will stumble on the right balance of attention, and your mind will be firmly established in the thought, feeling, I am. Whatever you think, say, or do, the sense of immutable and affectionate being remains as the ever-present background of the mind. Maharaj uh, helped me experience uh, that which I am and, and that which you truly are by virtue of the grace that is offered through the book I Am That. This is how it occurred to me and in my conversations when I visited with Nisargadatta Maharaj, he made it very clear 
that the transmission in my case had already occurred because of the way in which I embraced the teaching that was offered to me in I Am That. And wonderfully, the very same opportunity is there for anyone else that would read I Am That. I can promise that that spirit that was there for me in I Am That is still the same spirit that is alive now, today. It does not need Nisargadatta to be present and alive in his body. The I Amness initially is a, a pale reflection of what is. It is not true, truly what is, but it is a reflection of it filtered through our minds. And that I amness will develop. As one meditates more and more on it, it develops. And in fact, eventually, it, it fades as concept. It fades away as concept because its unreality is seen. And then that I amness becomes something utterly different. It becomes an isness. What isness? When Maharaj spoke of the I am or I amness, as it is also translated, he spoke of it as the bridge between that which is temporal and that which is eternal that to recognize that all the forms of senses of seeing and hearing and smelling and thinking are changing and to step outside that to get bigger one becomes if you will the witness to these things and this is what he called the I amness everything changes but this witnessing which can know what is so and when you rest in that witnessing in that I amness then as a bridge it becomes possible to turn that witnessing back to itself and see that there is no one who witnesses, that witnessing appears like the sun does in the morning and disappears, and beyond that is space and emptiness and what he called love and wisdom. Maharaj put it this way. He said, when I see I am nothing, that is wisdom, and when I see I am everything, that is love, and between those two my life moves. Maharaj often spoke of his guru and the role of the teacher in spiritual life. Every morning he reverently decorated the photos of his guru that hung in the upstairs room. He often said that the true teacher was one's own self. The greatest guru is your inner self. Truly, he is the supreme teacher. He alone can take you to your goal and he alone meets you at the end of the road. Confide in him, and you need no outer guru. But again, you must have the strong desire to find him, and do nothing that will create obstacles and delays. You are never without a guru, for he is timelessly present in your heart. What he wants you to do is simply learn self-awareness self-control and self-surrender. It may seem arduous, but it is easy if you are earnest and quite impossible if you are not. Everything yields to earnestness. The true Guru will never humiliate you, nor will he estrange you from yourself. He will constantly bring you back to the fact of your inherent perfection and encourage you to seek within. Nisargadatta referred to the illusory sense of being, traditionally called the ego, as the I amness. He says that to find the source of this I amness and fully understand it as nothing more than a conceptual idea of oneself is the way to self realization and wholeness. Maharaj asks the seeker to be in the state which is prior to the experience of I amness. The concept I am comes spontaneously and goes spontaneously. Amazingly, when it appears, it is accepted as real. 
all subsequent misconceptions arise from that feeling of reality in the I amness. The moment the feeling I am appears, the world also appears. Any image you have of yourself is not true. True knowledge is to abide in your own self. The teachings of Maharaj move our awareness from the I amness, this sense of separate identity, to a non dualistic state of oneness with the Absolute, which is our real nature. Visitors asked for clarification concerning this state of emptiness. I mean, free of all content. To myself, I am neither perceivable nor conceivable. There is nothing I can point out and say, this I am. You identify yourself with everything so easily. I find it impossible. The feeling, I am not this or that, nor is anything mine, is so strong in me that as soon as a thing or a thought appears, there comes at once the sense, this I am not. I find that somehow by shifting the focus of attention, I become the very thing I look at and experience the kind of consciousness it has. I become the inner witness of the thing. I call this capacity of entering other focal points of consciousness love. You may give it any name you like. Since at any point of time and space I can be both the subject and the object of experience, I express it by saying that I am both and neither and beyond both. From the point of view of self-realization or enlightenment, there are no individuals. The self, or God, exists as all manifestation. A visitor asked Maharaj how this individuality arose and why we think of ourselves as separate individuals. Your thoughts about individuality are really not your own thoughts. They are all collective thoughts. You think that you are the one that has the thoughts. In fact, thoughts arise in consciousness. As our spiritual knowledge grows, our identification with the individual body-mind diminishes. And our consciousness expands into universal consciousness. The life force continues to act but its thoughts and actions are no longer limited to an individual. They become the total manifestation. It is like the action of the wind. The wind doesn't blow for any individual, but for the entire manifestation. To see the relative as the relative, to see the false as the false, to see the snake as a snake or the rope as a rope but not to get mixed up between the two to see what is is all that's required that's all that Maharaj is asking us to do so that we can discard the unreal and the real will manifest itself naturally by itself I know I can say this with complete assurance. I know. See, that's all that's necessary. I know. See? But you can't put it into words. You're free. You're free right now. You always have been. You've taken this burden on yourself of being a human being. See? But you're not. You've always been free. And it's a wonderful feeling. I'm free and nothing can harm me. Just see, see right, see the dif different level. I am, I am there, I'm the source. And then all those objects in consciousness, but I am the consciousness, I am the light of the consciousness. And don't change anything because it's useless. Don't try to understand even too much. Never. Once he told me, 
whatever you have underst understood can be of any use of it. That comprehension is a real knowledge. Maharaj was unique in that he, he asked for no ceremonies. There was, uh, you were just to remember and always remember that you are. You are, as far as the rest of it is concerned, there's nothing else you're sure of. You're only sure about the one thing, I am. Stay with that, that will take you. If you stay with that, that will take you to self-realization. That is it. Simple. Now, what happened for me once, I went to see him, and it was uh, unknowing, this, unknowing to me. It was the eighth time I had seen him. And I asked him the question, and I said to him, back when... You said, to, I asked you the question, a thought comes by called, I hate myself, and I grab onto it and say, that's me. Or a thought comes by called, I love myself, and somehow I identify with it. That's me. And again, I asked him, how does that happen? And he got very angry with me, actually, and he stood up and he was pacing back and forth and yelling and frothing his arms around, and he, and he said, you've been around long enough. You should know by now. There is no birth. There is no death. There is no person. It's all a concept. It's all an illusion. And he went like this, and this kind of light passed through me. And he said to me, now you know the nothing, and now you can leave. And when I walked out, um, going from his apartment to the train station to this three-hour journey back to the jungle where I lived, and you have to go through this awful Bombay craziness, I truly entered into that emptiness. And the only thing that I remember is just before I was ready to get off the train, which is some two hours later, I all of a sudden went, kind of snapped out of it for a second and remembered that he had said, are you willing to stay eight days and absorb the teachings? And I counted the number of days, and that was my eighth day. Questions concerning daily work and how one should conduct oneself in the world, Maharaj replied, Why do you worry about the world before taking care of yourself? You want to save the world, don't you? Can you save the world before saving yourself? And what means being saved? From what? From illusion. Salvation is to see things as they already are. Keep quiet. Do your work in the world, but inwardly keep quiet. Then all will come to you. Do not rely on your work for realization. It may profit others, but not you. Your hope lies in keeping silent in your mind and quiet in your heart. By all means, attend to your duties. Action in which you are not emotionally involved and which is beneficial and does not cause suffering will not bind you. You may be engaged in several directions and work with enormous zest, yet remain inwardly free and quiet with a mirror-like mind which reflects all without being affected. The unexpected is bound to happen while the anticipated may never come. All is because you are. Grasp this point firmly and deeply and dwell on it repeatedly. To realize this as absolutely true is liberation. 
Nisargadatta's body succumbed to cancer in 1981. During the last year, as his body became frailer and frailer, he refused to stop the flood of visitors. Out of immense compassion and the urgency of spiritual seekers throughout the world, his small room was filled to capacity every day. Nisargadatta's message and teachings continue to guide seekers, they instill confidence in them that realization is possible here and now and that through earnest inquiry and faith in the teachings, one can be like him, living in a state of complete freedom and supreme peace. I'm, I'm sure that um, the uh, diagnosis of terminal metastatic cancer meant nothing to Maharaj because he had already gone through the process of his death as a part of the process of his spiritual realization. And that a part of that realization is the realization that one is not an entity, especially an entity that's confined by this mortal frame and that's the viewpoint that he constantly lived from and so the loss of this frame which was just the vehicle through which he, he expressed in this realm and embraced people that believe they are the body in this realm um, the loss of that was no big deal to him being with uh, Maharaj at that point in his life was an extraordinary experience because it was as though Maharaj had already left the body. It, 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 there was a, a, a tightly drawn skin around a skeletal frame. And it seemed almost transparent. And it was, though, it was as really as though he was wearing an overcoat that he was just about ready to discard. He wasn't related any longer to his body. It was amazing. And uh, even though his eyes would flash and he was uh, speaking truth and talking to us, it was as though uh, he was no longer connected with, uh, with the body the way uh, ordinary people are. It was an amazing feeling. Being with Nisargadatta Maharaj gave me the deepest experience that I have ever had of closeness to a human being who was truly free. And that freedom was filled with love and aliveness and spontaneity and fearlessness and a place of absolute stillness beyond all of that. That touched that same energy in myself and now I know it's true. It's that simple. Absolute freedom and happiness is yours to be had in a moment that it is everyone's birthright, and that if you wish this, you only have to genuinely look into the question, who am I? To see this I am that witnesses it all, and then turn to the I am and see that even that too arises and passes away, and find your absolute freedom. It's there for you. The one who has fully investigated himself, the one who has come to understand, will never try to interfere in the play of consciousness. There is no creator with a vast intellect as such. All this play is going on spontaneously. There is no intellect behind it. So don't try to impose yours to bring about any change. Leave it alone. Your intellect is a subsequent product of this process. So how can your intellect take charge of or even evaluate the whole creation? Investigate yourself. This is the purpose of your being. Spirituality is nothing more than understanding this play of consciousness. Try to find out what this illusion is by seeking its source. 
There can be no consciousness without awareness. There can be awareness without consciousness, as in deep sleep. Awareness is absolute. Consciousness is relative to its content. Consciousness is always of something. Consciousness is partial and changeful. Awareness is total, changeless, calm and silent. And it is the common matrix of every experience. What you are, you already are. By knowing what you are not, you are free of it and remain in your own natural state. It all happens quite spontaneously and without effort. Before the appearance of this beingness, whatever state is, that state is prior to or rather beyond beingness and no being state also. I prevail in that state before the arrival of beingness or before the arrival of no beingness also. And with the waking state, all this world is manifest because of my beingness. My world is manifest. That also is observed by that state, which is prior to beingness. The essential point of his teaching is that we already are absolutely free and that there is nothing that we have to do or make or become or change ourselves into. We simply have to see the truth of life, which is that we are not this body nor this mind, that they are a play of elements, if you will, and that when we understand that, there comes this extraordinary happiness and freedom. Maharaj put it this way. He said, when I see I am nothing, that is wisdom. And when I see I am everything, that is love. And between those two, my life moves. The Maharaj passed away on September 8, 1981. He remains present as the consciousness within each one of us.